Welcome to the National Security College and welcome to this uh, morning of uh, research presentations. We're, I'm, I'm Roger Bradbury, I run the cyberspace program at the college and for this week we have uh, a, a bunch of our overseas uh, collaborators, collaborators will be shot, um, we have our, uh, our overseas friends here and we'll be, we'll be talking cyber uh, till, we're, till we're sick of it, uh, in various formats. Today's format is a little different. What we're doing today is we're talking about research in progress. So it's not normally the sorts of thing you would open up to, a, as it were, a general, a lay audience, a general audience, but we thought we would. We thought we'd, as it were, lift the bonnet, or, or in deference to our American collaborators, lift the hood, and show you the working of research underneath. How, how research ideas come together and form and, and form new concepts and drive towards and drive towards new ideas and new ways of thinking about cyber. So you so you you're going to be treated to an eclectic. Uh, I'd like to say the word gallimaufry. I love that word. Uh, <laughs> collection, uh, uh, a gallimaufry of different sorts of projects that are that are loosely cobbled, loosely joined together under the cyberspace rubric, um, and that's because. This is an intensely interdisciplinary activity. It can't be done just with, with uh, computer science and physics. It can't be done just with policy activities, uh, uh, social sciences and, and policy thinking. It's got to have these things joined up together. Our program at the college is focused on bringing people from different specialities together, teaching them how to work together and learning how to work together uh, and also learning each other's languages. So some of the stuff today will be, will be in languages perhaps that are unfamiliar to you. If so, we'll explain it. Um, we'll explain to each other. So they're going to be short presentations about, of work in progress. They'll be 10, 15 minutes or so of here's the idea, here's where we're up to, here's what we're thinking about, here's where we think it's going and then 10 or 15 minutes of discussion about it. We're after your ideas, we're after your suggestions. Does this look like it's something interesting, something hot, could be going somewhere? We'd be very interested in, in, in your views. So we'll do it like that. We've got a bunch of presentations, um, and the first one is from a philosopher, uh, Nathan Ryan. It's called The Ontology of Cyberspace. Nathan did his masters in uh, uh, his, his his Master's in National Security Policy here at the college last year. He's now working for RAND Europe uh, with, with our esteemed guest, Paul Cornish. Uh, and this is, this is some of the work he uncovered when he, was, when he was working on his Master's thesis, working on the ontology of cyberspace. So, Nathan, can I invite you up? And we'll hear from you, and then we'll do some questions, and then uh, move on to the next talk. Thank you. Firstly, I'd like to extend my thanks to the National Security College for inviting me to talk this morning on an ontology of cyberspace. It's an amazing offer and I feel very humbled to be here talking back at the college where I graduated only eight months ago. I'm very grateful for the invitation to present what is a combination of two semesters work in 2014. Part of what I will present this morning was my thesis. It made up the third chapter. But first and foremost, it was the basis for the modelling and simulation work for the strategy and statecraft in cyberspace research team. As the title suggests, I'll be presenting on an ontology of cyberspace. Now, if you've got questions about what is an ontology, let's start with a seemingly more simple question. What is cyberspace? I assure you, by the end of my short presentation, you'll all know what an ontology is. However, we might not be any closer to understanding what constitutes cyberspace. So when talking about an ontology, I use the general definition amongst philosophers that ontological studies are concerned with analytically categorizing objects, entities, and things in order to better understand the existence of being and reality. Additionally, ontologies are content theories about the sorts of objects, properties, and relations between objects that are possible in a specified domain of knowledge. It is commonly said that ontologies carve nature at the joints. 
This means that we can group objects, entities and things together into different classes based upon their natural categories and where they come apart easily. It is worthwhile stating that an ontology is a model of reality and that concepts we use must reflect the underlying reality of the world. And this raises an interesting question. What are the objects that are relevant to strategy in cyberspace? And I come to define them as cyber phenomena. Um, and they can be thought as, as of the base units of our experience of cyberspace. The word ontology uh, in the discipline of information science takes on a bit of a different meaning. In short, computer scientists mean that the application of a philosophical ontology with a taxonomy to classify the names of individual objects and their relations to each other and attributes and properties. I ended up using the software package Protege to code and render the ontology. I'll show you those visualizations towards the end of my presentation. And at this point, I'd like to address the why bother question. The value of the ontology is really twofold. First, it classifies what we know into an abstract representation of knowledge. Ontologies are useful to philosophers and non-philosophers alike, since they help visualize the structure of knowledge. And secondly, they may be easily reused, shared, and translated and modified. In this way, they are perfect for keeping with the pace of technological change in cyberspace. OK, so now that we all know what an ontology is, let's start with a seemingly simple application. What would an ontology of cyberspace look like? Well, we might need to first take a step back and answer the question, what is cyberspace? So, what is it? Well, it's absolutely enormous. So let me run through some facts and figures at you. We've already equaled and surpassed the number of internet-connected devices on the planet versus the 7.3 billion humans already on the planet. By 2020, it's estimated that there'll be anywhere between 25 and 40 billion internet-connected devices in the world. That's somewhere between three and seven devices per human. Looking at cybercrime, that costs the globe alone almost 575 billion a year. There are large firms that control big swathes of cyberspace. Apple posted its historic market capitalization of 700 billion in November 2014, making it the most profitable company ever. And Cisco earlier this year predicted that the global internet will, put, will surpass one zettabyte for the first time ever after increasing fivefold over the past five years. That's an awful lot of information. It's one billion terabytes or one trillion gigabytes. So there's also a range of actors on the stage of cyberspace with competing interests, values, and motivations. There are hacktivist groups who deface websites and dox information, which is the pasting of private information to the public arena. Their political message is their key here. Some might classify anonymous as a self-organized hacktivist group. There's cybercrime syndicates that operate on the dark web, selling their scripts and zero-day exploits to the highest bidders possible for untraceable cryptocurrency. There's a whole spectrum of white, gray, and black hat hackers who make up the security community. And let's not forget the scholars and academics, like some of those in the room here today, because they all contribute to the ecology of cyberspace too. With all these actors on the same cyber stage competing with one another, it's little wonder that the stage is so crowded, confused, and complex. Structuring cyberspace in another way, there are regulatory bodies, both domestic and international, who form the complex regime of cyber governance. ICANN, IETF, WC3, they all play a role. So does the United Nations through the ITU. So let's return to the question of what is cyberspace? It can be defined as that large networked ensemble of computers. However, that's just a simple definition and it's by no means is by no means definitive and um, because it's such a diverse and expansive terrain comprised of millions of actors with equally diverse agendas. When overlooking cyberspace in its entirety, it's easy to become overwhelmed by both its breadth and its depth. It's not dominated by any one particular actor that is able to dictate absolute rules or set boundaries. The distribution of power throughout cyberspace is not directly proportionate to the wealth or military size of different countries. 
So there's obviously just too much detail, there's too much minutia to think that this could all be relevant to an ontology of cyberspace. So at this point, I turned to my supervisor at the time, Roger Bradbury, and said to him, Roger, there's just too much detail to get my head around. There's just too much on that stage of cyberspace. To which he told me, don't do miniatures, paint the Sistine Chapel. So coming back to my earlier question, what is cyberspace? Perhaps it's just not the best question to ask. Indeed, it's often said, there's no stupid questions, just stupid people. Oh, hang on, that's not quite the right quote. <laughs> the only stupid questions are the only ones that are never asked. That's the right phrase. Indeed, there are ill-phrased questions, there are limited questions, leading questions, and stunted questions. Philosophy is well equipped to deal with all these kinds of questions. And we can philosophy any question that we want. But the difficult question is asking the right question or a good question to stimulate an interesting and insightful answer. And this leads me to the research question at hand. So, the ontology seeks to adequately describe and classify the kinds of objects relevant to strategy and statecraft in cyberspace. The resulting ontology draws upon constructs from complexity science, philosophy, and cybersecurity. By focusing on the environment of cyberspace, we can begin to understand the interconnected relationships between cyber phenomena at different layers and how they influence each other. Given the complexity of the task at hand and all the interacting actors, we can say that it's a wicked problem. And policy analysts use this term, wicked problem, to describe those kinds of issues where you fix one problem only for it to lead to another problem. Indeed, different policy options have their ideological, cultural, political and economic impacts to consider. The current multi-stakeholder model of cyberspace involves a vast spectrum of actors including civil society, academia, the private sector and governments. In this way, complexity can be viewed as both a problem for theoreticians like myself as well as policy analysts. Interdisciplinary research is well equipped to deal with wicked problems that cross traditional academic boundaries. To achieve outcomes, interdisciplinary research responds to innovation in kind by keeping up with advancements and taking them into consideration with new and novel events. This is important when dealing with emergent cyber phenomena associated with cyberspace's growth. This makes analysing cyberspace using interdisciplinary research a prime example of combating the seemingly intractable real world problem. So cyber scholars in the past have split up cyberspace into corresponding layers of interaction to better understand the different roles each layer plays. I argue that more than any other uh, that any more than three layers is not necessary to understand the environment of cyberspace with all its complexity still intact. The US Department of Defense uses three layers with five sub-layers, whereas the researchers Alexander Klimberg and Philip Myrtle use four-layer model to describe cyberspace. So under my conception, there are three kinds of cyber phenomena. There's the technical, then the social, and the politico-strategic. These form the layers of cyberspace and uh, which are displayed at different emergent bases. This means that as social cyber phenomena emerge from the underlying technical layer, they still have the underlying properties too. However, just like emergence in nature, the causation of micro-level processes does not account for these new properties. As such, it is essential to view each cyber phenomena from a higher emergent base. Each corresponding layer has different attributes too, which give rise to the unique security concerns that are most novel to the environment of cyberspace. The technical layer is malleable, the social layer is virtual, the politico-strategic layer is power diffuse. Now let me describe each layer and its corresponding attributes. So, the technical layer on the bottom emerges from the self-organisation of physical components and hardware in the, cyber, in the physical world. They are composed of information and communication technologies that facilitate human interaction in cyberspace, including all the computers, 
laptops, smartphones, wearables, as well as the technical components that store data, process information, and physically enable connections into the digital commons. Whether those connections are provided through wires or cables under sea, fiber optics, or wireless technology like satellites and Wi-Fi, the mode of connectivity does not preclude the physical existence of hardware or the technical cyber phenomena. These are intentional entities orientated towards the functioning of the layers above and also vectors into the material world. The attribute of malleability has two intertwined components. There's horizontal malleability as well as vertical. The horizontal refers to the technical cyber phenomena expanding into the physical world as material components of ICTs push ahead to create a fully connected world with the advent of the Internet of Things. Whereas vertical malleability refers to specific instances of cyber phenomena that emerge from the underlying material forms of ICTs. For example, the introduction of IPv6 is a form of vertical malleability that has dynamic effects upon the layers of cyberspace above it. Looking at social cyber phenomena, these emerge from the self-organisation on the layer below and where most, if not all, of a typical user's daily interactions take place. This includes programs like Gmail, Twitter, Skype, PayPal, and their diversity reflects that of the diversity of digital online services. Social cyber phenomena are all made possible by the underlying technical components on the layer below. The social cyber phenomena requires analysis from another emergent base. Indeed, they are all really a cluster of technical cyber phenomena that are self-organized to produce emergence along with novel attributes. Viewed from the technical layer, social cyber phenomena would seem absurd and nonsensical, which is why we require another ontologically emergent base to analyze them from. For example, videos that are played through YouTube, letters that are shared through email, or even pictures, they are all composed entirely of computer code on the technical layer. Yet, through the self-organization of the code, they cease to be merely technical, taking a social form once they are displayed on a comprehensible web page through an internet browser. From this emergent base, we can see that social cyber phenomena are incidentally material or physical. Indeed, they display the attribute of being virtual. It is more helpful to think of them as a class of virtual and digital entities that challenge our intuitive understanding of space, geography, and time. In practice, we need to carefully consider the strategic implications of virtuality in cyberspace, as old paradigms are insufficient for thinking about phenomena that display this novel attribute, because virtuality eludes comparison. It must be analyzed on its own terms. It has two interrelated sources of strategic insecurity in cyberspace, which includes the attribution problem and the speed of connections. Now, looking at the top layer, the politico-strategic layer, these cyber phenomena emerge from the interaction and self-organization of the technical and social cyber phenomena below. Simply put, they are instances of cyber power. Examples of politi politico-strategic cyber phenomena include mostly technical cyber phenomena that display politico-strategic characteristics and include distributed denial service attacks, tightly clustered technical and social combinations, including sophisticated malware and espionage tools like Flame, Dooku, and Stuxnet, as well as loosely connected vast constellations of both technical and social cyber phenomena that clearly emerge at the politico-strategic layer, including China's Great Firewall. Emergent politico-strategic cyber phenomena are enabled by both the underlying technical and social cyber phenomena that cluster beneath them. Without them, the projection of cyber power is impossible. At this layer of cyberspace, politico-strategic cyber phenomena emerge and exhibit with the unique attribute of being power diffuse. A, a diverse range of empowered political actors have been the defining feature of this network society. Individual users, civil society, and non-state actors have felt this impact most significantly. The emergent attribute of power diffusion 
is the redistribution of power away from large, hierarchical and hegemonic actors and the empowerment of smaller, networked and non-state actors. Joseph Nye makes this original claim where he says that power transition from one dominant state to another is a familiar historical event, but power diffusion is a more novel process. The layers of cyberspace interact strongly with each other, especially those that are adjacent to each other. The lower layers of cyberspace create possibilities on the layers above. In this way, the exchange and self-organization at lower layers allows for emergence of cyber phenomena in the layers above. This layered analysis of cyberspace shows that the upper layers depend upon the functioning of the lower layers, but not vice versa. Sure. So here we have a full complex of cyberspace. It's a visualization of the ontology in Protege, which I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. Listed here are the classes and categories of actors in cyberspace, from firms to states to non-state actors and regulatory bodies. These are divided into subclasses, and right at the edge of the diagram, you can see individual instances of each of the categories. For example, anonymous falls into the hacktivist category within non-state actors, which is a class of cyberspace objects. Whereas here, we have a diagram of all the entities in cyberspace, along with the layers as well. So the entities from the last slide are on the left, whereas the layers are on the right. And the lines between them, between each entity and layers, refer to the possible interactions that take place between entities and layers. So you might be able to see how states are primarily concerned with the politico-strategic layer, whilst regulatory bodies interact with the technical layer below. So, to wrap up, my endeavour to determine the ontology of cyberspace has provided some clarity in working towards the ultimate question of what is cyberspace? It seems formulating questions is as important as answering them. By acknowledging the diversity and complexities and exploring the properties and relation between objects, the borders that encompass each scene of the Sistine Chapel have now been established and now we can progress to fill them in. In my thesis, I went into further detail to test the ontology against the real world. I did this by analysing the Great Firewall of China and showing how emergent cyber phenomena can be suppressed at the politico-strategic level by controlling the technical and social layers below. Looking to the future, more can be done to model and simulate the ontology. It currently provides the largest analytic buckets possible and further granularity can be added to enrich the ontology. So ultimately, as cyberspace evolves, the ontology must adapt and change if it's to continue to shed light on how states behave, compete and interact. Thanks very much. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you. Um, everyone, uh, I've just realised that we didn't have out on the tables there the uh, agenda for this morning. Uh, probably the smallest of the snafus that have been stalking us through organising this process the, the whole week. So I'll, I'll, before we uh, offer you the chance to, to uh, question, to throw some questions at Nathan, I'll tell you that after Nathan's talk, uh, Adam Henschke is going to talk about ethics in cyberspace. And then after that, uh, John Lindsay from Monk School at the University of Toronto will talk about cross-domain deterrence. Morning, then occurs morning tea. After that, I'm going to talk about balkanisation in cyberspace, some modelling work we're doing. Uh, Paul Cornish will then talk about governance in cyberspace. And then Terry, uh, finally, before lunch, uh, Terry Boss and I will talk about tipping points in cyberspace. And, and I might, I might uh, say, as we used to say in Queensland in, uh, in, uh, in the middle, proceedings like this that gentlemen may remove their coats. So this is a this is a um, a sort of a, a sleeves up uh, working session and uh, we need to be too formal. So Nathan can I ask you uh, to accept some questions? So shall we have some questions from the floor please? My name's Hitchin Tucker and I'm from Defence. Thank you. Um, my point was that I think that the layers just don't go one way that you would have, for example, um, some effects 
desire at the upper level that might drive some sort of innovation at the lower level. Yeah. Um, and hence, the only point being that you wouldn't always uh, think about uh, effects traveling just one way. Yeah, so there could be some downwards causation. Yeah, so I think I didn't necessarily make that clear enough, but I think that that is definitely the case. Um, and when I sort of tested it against the example of China and the Great Firewall, you know, the emergence of you know, phenomena at that top layer, they want to preclude that, so therefore it has some downwards causation. So there's some knock-on effects at the social layer below and then the technical layer right at the bottom. So, yeah, I, I know that there, there is some sort of downward interaction as well, but the underlying feature is that it can't, you know, cyber power is not possible unless there's some technical layers, some social layers, and then right at the very top. Uh, Jason Brown from Talos and uh, Chair of the Australian Standards Committee for Security Resilience. Um, the, the interesting part about your ontology that, that I want to raise a question on is looking at it through the eyes of the objectives of the players. Mm -hmm. So clearly when you're looking at the state level there's, there's certain state interests etc and the Great Wall analogy is a useful one. But um, have you thought to stretch that into where the intersection of that <coughs> and the impact of social cohesion within the virtual space actually creates um, power and obviously you know the so-called Arab Spring is a classic example of that. Mm -hmm. um, so so in a sense it, it not looking just through a lens of, of how the technologies operate with each other, but that combination of uh, intent and objective of the of the actors. Um, that's just your thoughts. Yeah so I think that the motivations are really interesting and again they're really diverse. So for each group, you know, they might necessarily be motivated by power itself. They might be, you know, motivated by money and greed and prestige and things like that. So um, I guess that's one part of the motivation. But then the other that you're sort of hinting at there is like, you know, the self-organisation of people at the social level um, and how that can disrupt power relations amongst states and things like that. Yeah, and it seemed to me to follow on, that's the intent of the Chinese to ensure that that doesn't happen. Yes. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I think having an ontological model is quite useful because people so I can talk to people about it and say this is how it fits together. But that you were talking about developing the next layers of complexity. I think it's the interaction between the layers that for me might be more critical in understanding the consequences for strategy and statecraft. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. So, uh, Peter Grabowski, Regulatory Institutions Network at the ANU. Uh, you cited a figure of $575 billion uh, per year uh, due to uh, losses to cybercrime. Mm. How confident are you in the validity of that <laughs> estimate? And, and, and does it include uh, indirect costs such as all expenditures on IT security? Great question. Um, but you being from Regnet and probably know more about cybercrime than I do, um, I'd probably like to ask your thoughts on if that's a valid answer or not. <laughs> nice return. To me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think there was another figure sort of bouncing around that a fifth of that is, you know, cost to America. Um, so, and then the globe being obviously much larger than that. But um, I think that was just to try and give you a feel of the size and the scope of the problem <laughs> and just how much there is going on how much value there is there. Great, thanks. Uh, Greg Austin from the University of New South Wales, Canberra. Uh, thanks for your presentation. The, uh, when you look at the Great Firewall of China as a test case, for example, uh, you seem to um, imply a, a closed model. What about the countervailing influences from the three layers from outside China, like you know, the uh, uh, political pressure from the United States or from the rest of the world on, on the Chinese system or at the technical level? availability of Chinese citizens to access yeah. yeah, so I think that that's really quite interesting if you see, you know, China as this balkanised part of the web that's sort of off in its own little corner that has its own technical, social and politico-strategic layers, then that might be interesting to sort of model that plus, you know, the rest of the world and what their standards of openness are and what their technical layers looking like more than just the Chinese. Um, you can sort of I think that point of my question was that the external world probably shapes the Chinese world much more than your brief presentation suggested yeah. at those three levels. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that, you know, 
one of the questions is, you know, can the web sort of balkanize at that bottom layer, at that technical layer, or is there a common technical standard that has to sort of, you know, unite and that there has to be cooperation on that technical layer so we can have interactions possible and then just call, like, you know, split off the, the social layers and not have, you know, Facebook, Twitter in China and then definitely try and keep those politico-strategic layers from ever sort of meeting so that you can't feel the effects of foreign states through cyberspace. I'm Carol from the School of Maths and Biology. I'm just thinking, in all of your ontology, have you considered the fact that you know, currently there is a lot of movement in the social movements? So you were looking at things like uh, malware and DOS attack, but how does the, you know, the social thing that's happening, you know, like for example, the Carmichael mine trying to stop that, the uh, dredging of uh, the Great Barrier Reef, and that's basically a groundswell of movement available to social media, for example. So how does that fit into your point? Well, I guess that sort of comes at that social layer. And that can all sort of swarm together there and people can interact and they can use the technology to connect with each other and to share ideas and then that sort of reflects our, you know, liberal democracy in a certain sense. But it's that next layer above, like where states compete, where it turns out to be instances of cyber power, about messaging, about strategic communication, um, states competing and vying for power and shaping each other through that. I think that's kind of where uh, the research questions kind of pitched out. Yeah. yeah. I'm Alex Watkin from the Department of Finance. The three layers you sort of uh, described, uh, is that kind of reflective of what we've always had as human civilization? Really, basically, if you go back to ancient Egypt, you're still talking about political, strategic, you're still talking about technical, you're still talking about uh, the social aspect. So, really, what differentiation is, is in terms of technology we adopt as human beings to actually give us this. Uh, I suppose the advancement of what we're seeing. So, you know, even the Sumerians, the ancient Sumerians had clay tablets. So we now happen to have an electronic tablet to do certain things. So basically, having made a study of some of the ancient civilizations and drawing some of the ontology in terms of the word thus far. I'm just curious, just in general. Yeah, yeah, I think it's it's an interesting question. Um, and I don't think that it's removed from the rest of historical movements. I just think this is now the novel way that this has played out, this is just the fifth domain, you know, land, sea, air and space, they've sort of been there in those military settings before and cyber is just sort of the next iteration of that. And then you can sort of draw those links through history as well. So I think it's just more of a continuation than a, than a distinct, you know, paradigm shift. So that's why it's so interesting as an interdisciplinary study because you've got to draw all those things back into it to try and answer, you know, these kinds of research questions. Mm. Hi, between your research on your research on the Great Wall, Firewall of China, in your opinion, how sustainable is it considering the rising you know, middle class and as you know, people, you know, get well get access to education, get access to internet. You've got resources, for example, people demanding you know, more minerals and then a lot of trade happening on, you know, web-based platform like Alibaba. And, you, and you've got the emergence of technology and innovation and you've got a Chinese rival to, say, Facebook and Twitter, you've got Weibo as their, um, you know, messaging platform. Third, the rise of legitimate non-state actors such as businesses, you know, um, China welcoming foreign direct investment and having a, you know, their engagement in regional fora like ASEAN, APEC, for example, to, to the G20. So those, in light of those three factors, how sustainable is the Great Wall, the Great Wall of China? Um, so I'm not sure if I'm probably the best person to answer for, for that one. Um, I think there's some China specialists that would be able to answer that one a lot more eloquently than I possibly can. However, I was just, you know, using the ontology in a different setting, in a non-Western setting, to sort of test out, to see how emergence takes place at those layers and how it might be different and how it might be suppressed. So, um, I don't think I'm really answering your question there to say, you know, what's the long-term future in China's internet looking like? Um, but I'm probably not the best person to, to try and 
give you a precise answer on that one. Okay. I think that might be like, you know, with the, the rise of the internet and humans, mm. like, um, oh, I'm not sure um, you mentioned that, mm. that this has happened for years and years in you know, you know, Egypt. Um, but I think practices are changed because of, of internet and internet and the increase in connectivity making like you know, things a bit easier in terms of transactions and cross border trade and data flows. With the rise of the middle class in China, yeah. there's a lot of, I guess, people power, people movement. Um, and there's an increasing appetite for knowledge. So I'm not sure how sustainable is the great firewall of China, but I think yeah. there are cracks in there. Yeah. You know, through the power of people on the internet and um, the increasing access to information, trickling down slowly to the people to empower them to make a change. Yeah, okay, well, that, that's a very interesting point you've made. And uh, I think you're in a good audience, you're in a good place here to get that. <coughs> to, Take that a little bit because of coffee, you might introduce yourself to Greg Austin over there and to John Lindsay, each of whom have published books on that very subject in, in this last year. So they, you've got, you've got the uh, the neural firepower here in the room to get, uh, to get a to get a really uh, nuanced view of that issue. Uh, should you wish that, uh, we've got one time for one last question. John, you had your work. Uh, this question might be a little too philosophical, but it doesn't get more philosophical than ontology, so I guess that's <laughs> okay. Um, and I'm going to say that the, the easy answer to this might just be, you know, for simplicity of modeling, you need to make some assumptions. But my question is, you know, you've kind of given ontological priority to this technological layer, but when you look historically at the development of the internet or any technology, it happens in a very specific historical and economic context. And I mean, the, the internet is a function of um, well-protected and insulated scientists with fairly large budgets at these large US government and academic computing centers, having the freedom to tinker and put these things together um, in service of long-term US competitive strategy vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet liberated scientists to, to do their things. Um, and to, you know, there's, there's this notion that the internet is kind of this free-for-all, but really it is kind of a liberal institution that the United States set up. So you've got not only the social embedded in the very development of the technology and its decentralized protocols, uh, you've got geopolitical competition incentivizing and creating and shaping the thought of, of the original internet. So how do you kind of then take that historical phenomenon and then parse that back into three layers? Yeah, really good point. Uh, and I think that that kind of comes back into there's some downwards causation going on, that, that it is a complex adaptive system you know that once there is a change in one layer, then there's some changes going on in another place. You sort of poke that balloon, it's going to, you know, come out somewhere else. So I think that there is definitely some tighter interactions, some tighter couplings between the social and the technical uh, <laughs> that maybe, yeah, it gets glossed over when you've sort of got a three layered model with so many different competing actors and things like that. So um, I think, yeah, once you get to sort of drill down and get to the granularity there, those sorts of things will come out. So maybe at a future point, and then you sort of embellish the model in that way and pick up on some of those finer details. Nathan, yeah. thank you. Um, I'd ask you to thank Nathan in the usual way, please. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on to our, our next talk, which is by Dr. Adam Henschke on ethics in cyberspace. Adam is a research fellow and lecturer at the National Security College. Um, this isn't a, uh, a, uh, a philosopher's uh, colloquium monke. Um, this will, uh, we do have some other things. It's just turned out that way that we kicked off with two, with two philosophers. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Roger. So as Roger said, um, I'm an ethicist and philosopher um, working here at the National Security College. And the two main areas that I work in that I guess brought me to the NSC, um, firstly, I look at philosophy and ethics of information technologies, um, and I also work a bit in just war theory. So what I'll do is I'll very quickly go through some of the different areas of research that I've been working on and am currently looking at into the future. So the first one um, is I've been looking at the ethics of cyber warfare generally. 
Um, some of the work that I've done here involved, um, I'm a participant in a National Science Foundation grant over in the US that involves University of Western Michigan, University of California Polytechnic, and the Naval Postgraduate School. And what we've been looking at are these general issues of ethics in cyber warfare and how does cyber warfare relate to just war theory. Um, we put on a couple of workshops in Geneva a few years back, um, one of them with the Brochet Foundation, uh, one of them with the International Committee of the Red Cross. And what those workshops were looking at was the relations between international humanitarian law and cyber warfare. And I'm slightly excited to say that I have a book hot off the presses. Um, it arrived in my office yesterday, um, which is part of the result of some of these workshops. It's called Binary Bullets, The Ethics of Cyber Warfare, and it's edited by myself, Fritz Orhoff, and Bradley J. Strasser. And what we've done here is looked at a bunch of different issues in and around the ethics of cyber warfare. So the four main areas that we've looked at are firstly, emerging norms or foundational norms in cyber warfare. Secondly, cyber warfare and the just war tradition. So how does cyber warfare relate to just war theory or does it even relate? Third is the ethos of cyber warfare. So looking at things like the code of the cyber warrior and psychological impacts of cyber warfare. And then the fourth part, which makes, I think, cyber and cyber war a bit different to the standard just war stuff is cyber warfare, deception and privacy. Um, so if any of you want to have a quick peek at this, I'll, I'll have it here, come and have a grab. Um, second thing that I've been working on is looking at relations between convergent military technologies. So as we see the development of new military technologies, we're seeing the rise of things like artificial intelligence, robots, drones, and cyber weapons and cyber warfare, and obviously underpinning AI, drones, robots, these sorts of things is cyber. So these issues of what counts as cyber warfare, does cyber warfare even relate to, to the real world, I guess, you can see it expressed in things like drones. And we can see challenging issues coming up in areas of artificial intelligence. Um, I've been doing a little bit of stuff with Unity, the United Nations uh, Institute on Disarmament Research. And one of the, or some of the things that we've been looking at there are, if you think of disarmament, um, often it you know, looks at issues of well, how many bullets do people have, how many bombs do they have, these sorts of things. When you get to something like cyber, how do you count disarmament in, in cyber? Because you've got these conceptual things that live in cyberspace that are probably non-countable in a normal sense. So how do we relate something like disarmament theory um, and anti-proliferation, how do we relate those things to something like cyber where we don't actually have countables, at least in a standard sense? Um, one of the third areas that I've been looking at are concepts of weapons and war. So this is where some of the philosophy comes in. So again, if we think of guns, bullets and bombs, you know, these are fairly obvious things of what a weapon is. You fire a gun, it hits someone and kills them or not. Um, do we have a similar thing in cyber? So are there even things as cyber weapons? Again, if we've got a cyber attack that occurs only in cyberspace and only virtual things are harmed, does that count as a weapon? Um, we've also got issues, and this is where cyber becomes kind of interesting, we've got issues extending beyond standard accounts of attack, so psyops, um, psychological operations that use cyber, um, do that count actually, or do they count as a weapon? They're possibly going to be an important part of a military campaign, but they're not weapons in the standard sense, so how do we conceptualise weapons? And I think cyber's pulling out some of these hard issues that sit in and around our ideas of war and weapons, um, so it's not necessarily a novel thing that cyber warfare has to deal with, but cyber warfare is showing that we have these gaps in existing work. Um, one of the PhD students here at the NSC, uh, Shannon Ford, who's sitting up the back there, um, he's doing work on ethics and issues around sub-war. So we've got this idea of uh, warfare, which is again kind of states fighting states. What about issues where you're not quite at levels of war? So again, cyber operations, psyops, these sorts of things seem to sit at the level of sub-war, but what's the ethics of that? And that seemed to be one of the things that came out of our um, workshop at the International Committee of the Red Cross was we've got international humanitarian law and um, we can apply that to, to cyber when we're in states of war, but the vast majority of cyber operations seem to be sub-war. So what do we do with this? What's the ethics of this? How does this relate again to just war theory? And how does this relate to other ethical issues? So that's the kind of war stuff um, that I've been looking at. Um, I guess following from this idea of sub-war, um, use of cyber technologies and things like psyops and things, one of the, the research areas that Roger, myself and a few others are trying to, have been pushing a bit and are trying to kick off uh, with some research grants at the moment is 
ethics and best practice of intelligence. So post Snowden, we've obviously got a lot more information about some of the uh, things that national security agencies around the world have been doing in terms of surveillance of, of citizens and non-citizens. Um, following those revelations, people have been quite either confused, angry, or at least questioning, well, what is it that uh, these intelligence institutions are actually doing? You know, what are they doing in our name? And then when we think of the ethics, what should they be doing? And one of these research areas that Roger and I and others are working in is how do we get the intelligence agencies to start doing good or continue doing good or do better? So this idea of best practice and how do we actually bring best practice into, into institutions like national security institutions, particularly where things are often quite secretive, so it's hard to work in these areas. And then parallel with that, we've got the importance of national security. So that seems to protect, um, or there, there's claims that it seems to protect against changes from the outside. But as we've seen post Snowden, um, there's a lot of interest and I think there's a lot of important ethics in and around intelligence practice, which comes from this, this focus on cyber and cyber security. Um, second last area that I work in is issues to do with surveillance. Again, kind of coming out of Snowden stuff, um, ethics of surveillance. So I'm finishing a book at the moment, which is looking at relations between identity and personal information um, and covers areas to do with privacy, property rights, um, so we can see the general structure of arguments in and around surveillance where you've got a, a tension between, say, individual rights versus the social good. Often uh, in these scenarios, it's considered as national security issues. But then there's other values that we might want to uh, focus on. For instance, efficiency and cost. So often we see with um, cyber and surveillance, it's often, well, you've got individual privacy versus national security. We've got this tension between these two things. But one of the things that, to my mind at least, is often not spoken of is efficiency or cost. So we're happy to take on something like Gmail because it's a free um, email and it's really, really easy to use. And so in this sense, it's very low cost to us, but then we complain when our privacy is lost through either Gmail and Google doing things with their information or national security agencies accessing the information on Gmail. But we're probably, most of us at least, are unwilling to either pay for an email server which might have a greater level of privacy and might have greater levels of security or where we don't have the capacity to work with more complex systems that aren't as user friendly. So we've got here this thing that we're often thinking that surveillance and issues around surveillance are just privacy versus you know, the, the state or social good or something like that. But we often look at or overlook other values, which I think are quite important in trying to work out what we can be doing and what we should be doing. Um, final area that I've been looking at is uh, to do with trust and resilient systems. So if we think of trust here as something distinct from reliance, in reliance, it's often just looking at um, tools or artifacts, um, whereas trust is, at least in the philo philosophy literature, is often considered to have a, an element of human motivation. So if I trust someone, it's because they're motivated uh, towards helping me or fulfilling a promise or these sorts of things. Um, cyber, when we think of the cyber realm, we've got information and technologically mediated relations. And so there's a gap between what I'm doing and possibly the outcome or the person I'm working with or these sorts of things. Um, so we have to actually trust that the person is who they say they are, that they're going to be uh, working in my best interests and that there's no one else kind of watching me or interfering with that. So trust plays a really important role in cyberspace. Um, and the, the work that I've been doing in this area looks at um, trying to increase reliance, um, sorry, increase resilience in the system by modelling the trust relations that occur between different actors and working out, well, if this trust relation is to suffer or if this trust relation is to um, fail as a result of the cyber attack, what does that mean for the resilience of the system? And if we can increase the strength of those particular trust relations between different actors, we might be able to increase the resilience of the system so that we don't have to focus so much on prevention of cyber attacks but we can use trust as at least one, one element of developing resilient systems um, which don't suffer so much from cyber attacks. Um, so that's the, the quick summary of the stuff that I've been working on. Um, if you've got questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Thank you. Whatever you ask. Thanks. Right, questions. Uh, thanks, Adam. My yeah. name is Colette Webster from Prime Minister in the Cabinet. I just want to take you back to your comments on ethics in sub-war periods, yep. um, particularly thinking in the context of the peacetime norms agenda that's very prominent at the moment. We've seen a number of announcements from the US even came up in G20 last year. And just interested to know whether you considered how different ethical perspectives that come from 
national, cultural and historical uh, backgrounds, say China, Russia, even Europe and throughout Western countries, will impact on that peacetime norms debate. We all have a different idea of ethics, um, and yet the West, if you like, is pushing a particular agenda. Have you got any comments on those prospects? Yeah. So this is a really good question. Um, I think we can even get a little bit more general. Um, some of the stuff that I've looked at is to do with um, how we understand war. And I think that there's at least some evidence to, to show that the Western understanding of war could be quite different to the Chinese understanding of war and the way in which they're approaching warfare. So um, some of the, the things that inform, or that might be informing the Chinese conceptions of warfare are an idea of continuous warfare, but that's not um, limited to kind of direct military intervention. So it may be the case that China actually see themselves in an information warfare already with the US and the West more generally. Um, the reason why this is important, how it in part relates to your question, is what we need to do, I think, and this is where um, at least my philosopher hat comes on, is we need to at very least be understanding of how we understand war and how you know our other, other groups that we're dealing with understand war. So if China has a very different concept of war and they're operating from that and we don't recognise that, then that's going to possibly have a big impact on, the, on our relations with them and the way in which we're approaching them. When we bring this to the ethics stuff, um, to my mind, um, ethics at its core, the core values that inform our behaviours and tell us what we should and shouldn't be doing, it's the same across all cultures, all um, all peoples, through history, and you can look at a whole bunch of anthropological research that says almost all the time we have the same sets of values that are informing our decisions and telling us what we should or shouldn't do. For instance, if I kill a baby, it's going to be seen as bad in Australia, it's going to be seen as bad in China, it's going to be seen as bad in at least many parts of ancient Greece. Um, so this stuff extends beyond, uh, across culture and across time. Where the difference comes in is the way in which the Western, um, Western communities express and communicate their senses of ethics. So we use terminology in the philosophy literature about um, human rights and deontology, about utilitarianism and maximising the social good, about justice and equality of treatment across people. Um, and the danger is if we think of it and we only think of it as being expressed in the terminology that we use, this might present the case that it's quite different to other cultures and other communities. But at the core, I think the same values are informing these other cultures. What we need to do is find the areas of overlap and find the areas where we're actually really similar and go, okay, we've got this commonality here. There's gonna be some differences at the margins, but we've got this commonality. We can work with that commonality and then try and realize what these differences at the margins are and hopefully either avoid them or kind of iron out those differences. Thanks very much, Anna. Uh, Paul Connors from around Europe. Um, Adam, I, I really enjoyed that. Uh, this is what you had to say, and I'm certainly going to um, uh, try and get hold of a copy of your, of your book, um, ideally one of the free ones you've got in your office. <laughs> um, I mean, like you, I, I mean, I've long been fascinated by the just war tradition since an undergraduate study of theology and, and reading Aquinas. And since then, so this goes back a few years, I've always thought that somehow, somehow this must be applicable to everything. Um, to do with conflict and, and moral restraint in conflict. But my problem at the moment, and this is something I've been working on recently too, is it does seem to me that the more I look at it, I, I find it difficult to see other than that cyberspace is somehow incompatible um, with a framework for ethically guided judgment, um, uh, such as the just war tradition, um, as it develops in the context of, of conventional law. So my question is a very unfair one. I'm going to quote, um, uh, first of all, David Fisher, the late David Fisher, who wrote uh, an excellent book about five years ago, Morality and War, Can War Be Just in the 21st Century? Brilliant first class book. And he wrote this, we need to furnish a rational basis for our moral thinking, both in general and in particular, in relation to the difficult issues of war and peace. To be able to write about morality and war, it's necessary first to secure the foundations of morality. So my question is, what are the foundations of morality as far as cyberspace and cyber conflict and its ethical restraint are concerned? And if those foundations are just really just the same as, let's say, for normal conflict, uh, conventional conflict, <coughs> then why bother writing a book about the ethics of cyber conflict? Why not just write another book about the just war tradition? And, and I might remind you, as you go into discussing the foundations mm -hmm. of morality, <laughs> we only have a certain yes. amount of finite time yeah. left yeah. in the universe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paul. All right. So I can 
probably answer the foundation's question quite quite quickly, which is similar to what I said to the to the previous question. At least the way I approach ethics, I see it as um, and expressed in the, the kind of Western terminology, there's these three core values that inform what we do and what we think people should be doing. It's this idea of kind of basic respect for humans. Um, this is often termed human rights or deontological principles. We've got this idea of maximising good and minimising suffering, kind of utilitarianism or consequentialism more generally. And then the third one is the idea of justice and fairness, so equal things should be treated equally. I think these three values inform the basis for just war theory. Um, so in this sense, kind of everything is just war theory, but that's because arguably the foundations of just war theory are found in the more general foundations in ethics, which we can then apply to a whole bunch of different things. Where just war and the cyber stuff becomes relevant is just, or warfare seems to be a special case. So the thing that got me really interested in just war theory to begin with was I saw a guy give a presentation on just war theory a few years ago and he said something really strange. We generally think killing people is bad, if not one of the worst things that we can do. Yet in warfare, we not only justify killing, we often see people as sort of deserving medals for the things that they've done. So how do we, like, this, this seems really at odds with each other. And the important thing I think with thinking of just war theory is, and you know, there's probably people who might uh, argue against this, but we can see it as an exceptionalism. So given the particular conditions around warfare and the uh, threat to both national security and individual security and these things, we now have a bunch of exceptions that allow us to go out and do killing and these things. So warfare presents a special context for the ways in which we take ethics into account and the ways in which those ethical values are expressed. In terms of cyber, um, what makes it different is we've got, um, we've still probably got the same ethical values that are informing and underpinning how we should approach this stuff, but because cyber occurs in this kind of non-physical realm, we've got a whole bunch of different things which then say, well, even if we've got these just war principles, how do they apply in the non-physical realm? We've got issues of, you know, the non, or cyber is non-bounded by geography, the speed and pace at which cyber things occur is quite different, the actors who are going to be involved are quite different, it spreads across individuals, uh, companies and states, so that makes it different to the standard war stuff. So we've got to take those things into account to say, well, here's where cyber presents a, at least a variation on the just war stuff. My concern with the just war area is I think we can apply it to cyber and we can do it reasonably well and some of the research I've done is kind of going towards that but as I said at one point um, one of the problems with just going okay well we'll use just war to solve cyber the vast majority of cyber stuff isn't war related or it's sub war so it's either going to be cyber crime we've got things like espionage intelligence or other kind of things that are about interactions between states, maybe conflicts and hostilities between states, but they don't rise to the level of war. So I think this is where the just war stuff becomes quite limited. We can tell a story about justness and just war in relation to cyber, but most of the stuff we're doing isn't war, so we need some different approach there. So I think just war can apply, it's just not going to be that useful. Thank you, Adam. For a philosopher, that was a masterpiece of concision. <laughs> um, Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm reminded that when I was an undergraduate and, we, we, and we'd be rushing off through the refectory uh, to, our, to our physics labs, there'd be philosophy students sitting there. And then we'd finish the physics lab and rush somewhere else and they'd still be sitting there. I'm, I'm sure they were discussing the same question yep. three hours before. And they're probably sitting there still. And they're probably <laughs> sitting there still. I mean that gently. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, working in an interdisciplinary thing, we have to make allowances for all, <laughs> all different types of thinking, and so thank you. Okay, another question, sir. Uh, Tom Worthington from the Research School of Computer Science here at the ANU. I teach IT ethics yeah. to the ANU students. Quite a few are from the region, and some are admit to be military officers, so I suspect I'm training both sides in the next cyber war. <laughs> um, the ANU and and the Australian Computer Society carried out research on IT ethics and the views of professionals. Um, that didn't seem to me to conflict very much with the IT defence issues I had to confront at the Defence Department. I'm just wondering if you looked at that area. I must admit I avoided the problem when I wrote the IT policy of defence on use of the internet, where I said the internet is authorised for use for any authorised purpose. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm wondering if you've looked at the IT ethics that professionals would have who are in the military and how that relates to the um, normal warfare 
view of this sort of thing? So my PhD supervisor is a guy called John Weckett, who is one of the yeah. lead guys in Australia and is nationally kind of bringing in the idea of ethics and IT and computer ethics and these things. So I had a, a bit to do with him and his work on IT ethics and computer ethics generally. Um, and some of the work he did on the surveys with the ACS, the Australian Computer Society, and the impact of ethics training on IT professionals and these sorts of things. Um, part of it leaves me a little bit dispirited because at least from memory, some of those surveys showed that even those who got trained in ethics didn't really seem to have that much impact on their practice. Um, it's always a concern for teachers and these sorts of things. Um, in terms of looking at how IT ethics as a professional area relates to the military, um, I've not looked at that crossover. Um, I think it, I mean, it's, it's interesting and probably an area where I think the professionalisation of um, information technology and the ways in which we can bring um, concepts of ethics into these areas of professionalisation is a really good way to kind of draw out some of the, or hopefully motivate better behaviour with these people. Um, and by that I don't mean that we have good behaviour and they have bad behaviour, just trying to get better behaviour more generally. Um, and I think the issues within IT professionals working in the military might even make it easier because it's probably hard to think of what's ethically important if you're an IT operator who does maybe you know, the oversees uh, an accountancy database or something like that. It's going to be much easier if you're an IT professional whose work directly or indirectly brings about kind of military activity. You can say, look, you know, here's why what you're doing is really important. So there might be really useful areas there to use the military stuff to then go, here's why what you do is, is important and here's the ethics. And you know, we can point to the just war tradition as at least one set of motivations around why people should be taking care with what they're doing. So that doesn't quite answer the question, but it's something. I've got a question, a very short one. That doesn't let guarantee a short answer. <laughs> My question is, uh, as we develop uh, artificial intelligence and uh, autonomous machines mm. into the future, how do we embed ethics into uh, such developments of human civilization? Because if we need the control will go out of our hands into free thinking machines further down the track. Yep. So, and I'll try and keep this answer very quick, but this is one of the hard things of AI and autonomous weapon systems more generally. If they're going to be properly autonomous, then they're going to be making decisions that we haven't programmed in because they're going to be thinking for themselves and that we can't predict. And these are some of the core things that signify the difference between an autonomous machine and an automatic machine or something like that. I think the like there's a lot of people who are looking at the area of value sensitive design and how do we design ethics into our technologies generally and programming ethics into autonomous or semi-autonomous machines. The hard part is people have been arguing about ethics for at least three, four thousand years and the idea that we've got it solved now and all we have to do is program it into a machine, done, problem solved. I think that overlooks the complexity, not just the complexity of ethics but the lack of a single agreed account of what should motivate us. Like I said, that there's three values that motivate us in and around ethics, and there's a whole bunch of arguments about which of these takes primary um, place in our motivations. So I think it's going to be really, really hard to program the ethics in, not just because of the complexity and the hardness of doing these things in the real world, and especially in a complex place like the military, um, military practice, but because the ethics itself is still really hard and unsettled. So I'm, I think it's great that people are looking at the ethics of AI and how it relates to things like military practice, but I think it's going to be really hard, if not impossible, to program ethics in, in a way in which we're happy with it. Justifications for war, I'm sorry, uh, justifications for war are often based on um, soft evidence. I think, for example, in the Gulf of Tonkin incident, uh, uh, more recently, the uh, debate over weapons of mass destruction. The war of Jenkins Ear springs to mind. Uh, I'm sorry? The war of Jenkins Ear yeah, springs okay. to mind. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and given the ambiguities of, of uh, much activity in cyberspace and political challenges of attribution and the inclination of states such as the Democratic uh, People's Republic of Korea uh, to argue that, that um, even the screening of a motion picture could yeah. be regarded by, by that state as an act of war. Um, uh, why do you suppose the Iranian government didn't uh, react to um, the uh, attack on their uh, nuclear enrichment facilities as such? 
So one of the things that I think the the cyber cyber sphere and the looking at cyber warfare and the issues around that, I think what it shows is not so much that we've got all these new challenges coming out of cyber war, but it the cyber sphere highlights the challenges that we've already got and I guess the weaknesses and vaguenesses in our just war theory. So one of the things about just war is we'll have a thing of uh, just cause for, for military response. So someone attacks you, you've now got just cause for response. But there's going to be a huge amount of political issues and international relations, geopolitics around whether you do respond. And part of that you can, I guess, protect yourself by saying, well, this actually wasn't a an act of war, therefore we don't need to respond. So I think what the cyber stuff shows is that there's this stuff is hugely complex, even in the, the standard realm. Um, and what it does is it puts pressure both on our concepts that inform the just war stuff, but I think it also draws out the importance of information and knowledge within war. Um, and if there's anyone from the ARC here, I'm putting together a DECRA at the moment <laughs> on exactly these, these sorts of issues about the role of information, role of knowledge and the role of certainty in war generally, the fact that we've got these changing conditions of warfare brought about by technologies and non-state actors and these things, um, and how do we fit systematically these ideas of information, knowledge and certainty to our just war theory. So in a, if they are, so you're willing, then they'll give me the money and then I'll answer those questions in a few years. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Adam. Okay, I'm afraid that we have to draw that to a close. Adam, thank you very much. No worries. Thank you.